uh, Tate, she loves Jesus too. We've talked about the Lord. And, uh, she comes from a family who are just doing a great job teaching their family, their children, their grandchildren, the gospel of Jesus. And we're getting to see the fruit of that harvest here today. So Tate, upon your profession of faith in Jesus, as your Savior and your Lord, I baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ into his death. And ready to walk. Good to see you guys today on this um, cold, cold Sunday morning. We got a little spoiled yesterday, but I'm thankful that you're here today. We'll try to keep you warm, and I know it's tough. Those doors keep opening and closing, but just snuggle up, and uh, we'll make it through. It's going to be fine. I think the good news is maybe we're going to stay out of the severe weather for the next day or so, so we'll continue to pray about that, but be careful, be safe as you're out there. Let me just make you aware of a few things if you're not already. On the back of your worship guide, there's a list of some things coming up we want you to know about. The Legacy Summit is next Sunday afternoon. That starts at 4.30. You can pick up more information about that in the Fireside Room today. We'd love to have you sign up and be a part of that. And then right after that will be our quarterly church conference, so make plans to stick around and be a part of that. And also, uh, let me just remind you, down at the bottom and on the inside, you'll see it as well, our World Impact Celebration is coming up on March the 7th and 8th. On that Saturday night, March the 7th, we'll have about 15 of our mission partners here on campus. We're going to have a cookie bar. That's what I've been waiting to hear my whole life, <laughs> cookie bar. And uh, just an opportunity for you to get to meet some of these folks and their families and the fellowship together. So make plans for that Saturday night, March the 7th, and then a very special day of worship here on March the 8th. Um, Noah Oldham from St. Louis. Will and I were just up there with Noah a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Noah's going to be here with us that day. He's going to be sharing. Uh, Noah is a church planner in St. Louis and works with our North American Mission Board. And we're very excited to get to hear what God's doing there. So it's going to be a great weekend uh, for that. And also, pit crews are starting in March. Now, I know a lot of you know what pit crews are. But some of you don't. We've been doing pit crews around here for probably seven or eight years now. We kind of do them seasonally. Uh, we'll do them in the fall for a month or so. We'll do them in the spring for a month or so. And it's really a great opportunity just for relationship building opportunity to get to connect and meet some people in your church family. These will happen for about four or five weeks. And they're going to happen in people's homes. And it's just a time of fellowship and Bible study and a great time. So we would love for you to be a part of that. And the way you could let us know that you would like to sign up for those is on the green tearaway tab today. Everybody know what I'm talking about? I only talk about it every single week. On the green tearaway tab there, uh, you'll see it says under those check boxes, the last two are about pit crews. If you and your family are going to participate in a pit crew, and if you might be willing to host a pit crew in your home, just check those boxes and put your name uh, on the green tab today. We would greatly appreciate that. You can drop that in the offering plate later as that comes around. And also, if you are a guest here with us today and you'd like to find out more about Grace Life, you can use that green tab today as well. Just give us your contact information that you'd like to, and uh, we'd love to help you and serve you any way that we can. There's also some other boxes there that you might want to check. Maybe you're uh, wanting to join Grace Life or get involved in ministry or Sunday school uh, maybe you want to attend the next Membership Matters class. Whatever it may be, just let us know. We'll, we'll get with you and serve you any way that we can. Or maybe you have a prayer need. You can use it for that today as well if you want to share that with the pastors. And you can turn that in in the offering plates as that comes around a little while later. Or if you are part of the Grace Life family and you can't stick around for the next hour for Sunday school, just put your name on that green tab and drop that in the offering plate. We get a lot of bang for our buck on that green tab. Hey, I'm glad that you're here today. Let's stand together and let's do some jumping jacks and get warmed. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> let's get warmed up. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we want to thank you for who you are. You are good and faithful and we thank you, God, for this church family and God, we're grateful that we have a place we can meet in, a place where we can change the temperature and uh, God, we can find ourselves to be comfortable here. Sometimes we can find ourselves being too comfortable, sometimes even being lazy in the way that we approach you and the way that we worship you and the way that we go about our lives. And Holy Spirit, we would just ask you today to show us Jesus again and, and jolt us out of our 
self-centeredness and jolt us out of our complacency. And by your grace, could we just stand slack-jawed before you today, just in awe of your power and your love and your grace and your mercy. Would you stir our hearts today as, Holy Spirit, you do what you do best, and that is to lift up Jesus for the glory of his Father, for the building up and encouragement of your church. We thank you for what you're going to accomplish today. We come before you needy and hungry and poor before a God that is so perfect. And we want to just tell you today that we recognize that nothing in this place can happen apart from you. And so would you come and fill this place and fill our hearts with your glory. Show yourself strong here today. And we ask you to do this for your glory and for our joy. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Let's worship together.
Aren't you glad that Jesus loved us enough and would desire to be with us enough that he came and he rescued us sinners? Amen. Let's get sing this next song. It's, it's our God saves. And I was just encouraging the choir while we were getting ready this morning. Hey, this is a chance when we sing this song, we get to proclaim to people that may not know it that there is salvation and that there is a hope. And that's in the name of Jesus, the person of Jesus. And so when we sing this, we're singing this to each other that our God saves. We're boasting of who Jesus is. And we're not only telling that to each other, we're telling that to the folks that may be here this morning that don't know that. So when we sing, church, I want you to boast. I want you to shout it out, sing it out from the top of your lungs that our God saves. Let's sing this together in the name of the Father. Here we go. In the name. 
God, applause is yours. Shouts of joy are yours. There's no one else that can do what you can do. There's no one else can, that can change hearts. There's no one else that can provide conviction with grace and truth. And there's no one else that can save and restore and heal and repair brokenness. And so we come to you broken this morning knowing that our strength is in you and that your kingdom is forever. And so we trust in you this morning. When all everything around us gives way, we look to you because we know that you are there. We long for the day when we can be with you. But for now, we will trust in you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship, church. Our God is a consuming fire, a burning holy flame with glory and freedom. Our God is a righteous judge.
ushers are going to come to receive our offering. Our children, you guys can come, and we're going to have a story time together. I love that song. It comes from the great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, written by a man almost 500 years ago who found himself in a culture that was very anti-gospel and who found that in times like that, we can rest assured that our God is a mighty fortress for us when the days are dark and times are uncertain. Well, good morning, boys and girls. How are you guys this morning? Good. Good. Well, hey, this morning I got a story for you guys. It's called Running Away. It comes out of Luke chapter 15. And a grandma asked me a while ago about this Bible. She got her grandson this Bible. It's called the Jesus Storybook Bible. It's by Sally Lloyd-Jones. If you're wondering, if you're looking for something to share with your family, to read in your family devotions, it's a great thing, okay? Go to Lifeway. You can buy it there. Lifeway's also got a 365-day family devotional book right now on sale at the counter for five bucks, by the way. You're welcome. Here we go. You ready? It says, Jesus told this story about a boy who ran away. Once upon a time, there was a boy and his dad. And now one day, the boy gets to thinking, maybe if I didn't have my dad around telling me what is good for me all the time, I'd be happier. He's spoiling my fun, he thinks. Does my dad really want me to be happy? Does my dad really love me? The son never thought of that before, but suddenly he doesn't know anymore. So the son goes to his father and he says, Dad, I'm better off without you. I can look after myself. Just give me my share of your money. His father is sad, but he won't force his boy to stay. So he gives his son what he wants. The son takes the money and he goes on a long, long journey to a far off country. And everything's wonderful and perfect for a while. He can go wherever he wants. He can do whatever he wants. He can be whoever he wants. He's the boss and he's free. Does it sound good to be the boss? <laughs> Not sure. You kind of know where this story's going already, don't you? Sometimes he gets a strange, hungry, homesick feeling inside of his heart. But then he just eats more or drinks more or buys more clothes or goes to more parties until it goes away. But soon his money runs out, and so do his friends. And he ends up getting the only job he can find, feeding pigs. One day he's so hungry and desperate he even tries some piggy food. What am I doing, he says suddenly, as if he has woken from a nightmare. He spits, yuck, all of it, ick, out of his mouth. My father is rich, and here I am in a pigsty eating piggy food. He wipes his mouth, and he dusts himself off, and he says, I'm going home. And he starts for home, though, and he begins to worry. Dad won't love me anymore. I've been too bad. He won't want me for his son anymore. So he practices his I'm sorry speech. All this time, what he doesn't know is that day after day, his dad has been standing on his porch, straining his eyes, looking into the distance, waiting for his son to come home. He just can't stop loving his son. He longs for the sound of his boy's voice. He can't be happy until he gets him back. The son is still a long way off, but his dad sees him coming. What will the dad do? Will he fold his arms and frown? Will he shout, that'll teach you, and just you wait, young man. No, that's not how the story goes at all. The dad leaps off the porch, and he races down the hill, through the gap in the hedge, and up the road. Before his son can even begin his I'm sorry speech, his dad runs to him, throws his arms around him, and he can't stop kissing him. Let's have a party, his dad shouts. My boy's home. He ran away. I lost him, but now I have him back. Jesus told them, God is like the dad who couldn't stop loving his boy. And people are like the son who said, does my dad really want me to be happy? Jesus told people this story to show them what God is like and to show people what they are like so they could know however far they ran, however well they hid, however lost they were. 
it wouldn't matter because God's children could never run too far or be too lost for God to find them. Isn't that a good story? That God loves us no matter what. He loves us. And Brother Roy is going to come. He's going to pray for you guys and for our church. He's going to pray for our offering that we just collected, that God will do great things with that. So thank you, Brother Roy. Thank you, Josh. Let's pray. Father, we just come to you right now, Lord, thanking you that you did welcome us back with open arms, Father. No matter how far away we tried to run, Lord, you, when we run to you, you're always there. Lord, I thank you for these children. I thank you for Grace Life Church. Lord, I just pray a special blessing today. Lord, you just, in the time that we're going through, with the things that's happening in this state, Father, Lord Jesus, as we prepare as a church, Lord Jesus, to love the sin, love the sinners, but not the sin, Father. Lord, just teach us what we need to do and how we need to do it, Lord. I just lift up Brother Joel this morning, Lord, as he brings your word. Lord, we just lift up this offering to you. Lord Jesus, may you bless it and let everything we do glorify you. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. 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 Thank you, guys. I'll see you next week. Got another little kid I want to bring up here. She's real little, so her mom and dad are going to have to bring her. Braylon, come on down with mom and dad. And Tyler. <laughs> and Austin. Very good. And I tell you what, it, it, I would love for the rest of your family to come join you here on the platform. I know you're like, oh, don't make us get another song. Would you guys come stand with them? And today is a really special day for this family and this precious little girl named Braylon Barnett, who is a miracle of God to this family. Uh, through the miracle of adoption. And so we praise God for that, Dustin and Sarah. And we call this a baby dedication, but the reality is today it's not so much that we're dedicating Braylon to the Lord as much as really we're all dedicating ourselves, that Justin and Sarah are dedicating themselves as Braylon's mom and dad, Justin as the pastor of your house, the spiritual leader of your home. What a great call God has placed upon your life. We praise God, brother, for how you're being a good steward of that. And so today, you're just renewing that, that commitment to lead your family in the ways of the Lord. And, and, and now Braylon's a part of that. And it's, a, it's a, a commitment, a dedication that all you guys are making as part of Braylon's family, that also you're dedicating yourselves today to, to live your lives in such a way that you point Braylon to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a dedication of all us. As Braylon's church family, our church covenant says we, we promise to raise those under our care in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You guys re-promised that last Sunday. And so this is a good reminder today that we get to do that in Braylon's life. From those folks who are holding her back there in the nursery and as she grows in grace life here. And we look forward to that day that the Holy Spirit's going to come and reveal Jesus to her and show her that she's created in his image but sin has messed that up but Jesus has come uh, to give her identity back in Christ and so we look forward to that day and we believe it Justin the Bible says unless the Lord builds the house those who labor labor in vain and it's just a good reminder as moms and dads we can do all the right things uh, but God wants us to live as parents in dependency on him as family members and as a church on dependency upon him that his Holy Spirit will do a transforming, redemptive work in Braylon's heart and Braylon's life. So, I want us to pray together, and I want to invite any of you who'd like to come and stand with the Barnett family, and the rest of you just stand, and we're just going to be one big circle <coughs> of family here today. Braylon, can I hold your sister? Hi. <laughs> this is Braylon. All right. What would you think, big brother? I know you guys are excited. Well, let's pray together. Lord God, we bow before you today, and we thank you, God, for this precious gift. Uh, Lord, we thank you that long, long ago you had a purpose and a plan for Braylon Barnett. We thank you for the miraculous way that you brought her to her family. Father, we thank you for Justin and for Sarah being a, a, a husband and a wife, mom and dad, who love you and who walk humbly before you. 
We thank you for Austin and Tyler being great big brothers. We thank you, God, for their family that stands on this platform with them today to come alongside in this holy calling of pointing Braylon to you. And we thank you, God, for the Grace Life family that takes moments like these very serious and we approach them joyfully and soberly, God. We want to be found faithful in the way that we love Braylon and the way we live our lives before her. We want to point her to Jesus and we don't want to ever do anything that would cause her to stumble or to see you in a way that is not true and not accurate. So Holy Spirit, would you do a work of grace in all of our hearts that we might be found faithful in your sight and in hers today. And we ask it in Jesus' good name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. (laughs) Love it. It's one of my favorite parts of being a pastor. You guys can can be seated. And um, Austin, will you help me out? I have a Bible for your sister and a certificate for your sister. You can give that to her later, okay? You guys praise God for this family. Amen. Tonight, the Bush Center welcomes. Tonight, the Bush Center. Hold up. He wants to preach. <laughs> it's my Sunday, Dad. I got to be honest with you, man. I kind of dreaded today. Today's the first day, the first Lord's Day that we have been together as a church family since homosexual marriage became legal in our state. And in God's providence, the major, majority of our adult Sunday school classes today, that's the topic that you're dealing with, not because we're reacting to what happened in the news this week, but that material got written some time ago. And so we know that you're facing that in your Sunday school classes today. Our pastors wrote a letter to our adult Sunday school teachers earlier in the week to try to encourage them, because we know that uh, walking into this subject now is not an easy thing to do. And so I, I thought that maybe I should share with all of you the letter that we wrote to our Sunday school teachers this week. And, and I just know going in, I know going in today that there's going to be some of you today who, who just want me to go all hellfire and brimstone. And you're, you're going to walk out of today going, our, our, we're being too soft. And, and there's others who are going to walk out today who are saying that we're, we're being too hard and we're being too narrow. And, and I'll honestly say that um, when, when you pastor... And you walk with people, um, you, see, you see the world completely different, um, probably than the way you all see the world and the way you all see people. And there's millions of different nuances and, and factors, and, and it's complicated. And so I'm just aware today that, that I will get criticized today, probably from both sides and that's okay because my prayer just really is that Jesus will be pleased with um, what what I say and 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 how I try to lead our church to navigate in a day that we have never been faced with before in in this community and and in this state and and so we, we we tend to with this topic feel like there's only two options there's either affirmation or alienation and I don't think Jesus chooses either of those options. He eats with sinners. He was accused of that again and again. So we don't find him alienating people because they're sinners or because of their sin, nor do we see him affirming their sin and affirming them uh, that it's okay to continue on in their sin. And so uh, it's difficult. And so I, I just appreciate your prayers um, for your Sunday school teachers who are in a challenging position today and I would appreciate your prayers for your pastors who are in a challenging position because this issue um, really we face it at two different levels first of all we face it at the level of 
the LGBT political machine, which is aggressive and vicious, and their agenda is very clear that the goal in the LGBT political machine is that conservative Christianity would go away. That, that an orthodox biblical view of the scriptures would become obsolete in this nation. Um, and, and the groundwork is laid now for that to happen because this argument is being made in language of civil rights. And so very soon with our Supreme Court that will rule on this in June, Churches and pastors and Christians more than likely are going to be facing a situation in which we will, if we hold to an orthodox biblical interpretation of scriptures, we will be accused of discrimination. And eventually we will be viewed as breaking laws. I'm only 40 years old and so by God's grace I hope I get to pastor a long time. But the realization of the fact that fines and imprisonment are very, are very, um, very true reality that I could face um, in my lifetime. I, I don't say that to be dramatic. I don't say that to alarm anybody. It just is what it is. And... Um, so my daughter even asked me a couple weeks ago, she said, Dad, would, would, would you go to jail before you would marry a, a homosexual couple? And, and my answer is, I would. I would. That's the, first, that's the first dynamic of what's going on is this LGBT political machine. Now, the other side is individual people, men and women who are a part of the LGBT community. The way, the way that I want to deal with those people is completely different than the way I want to deal with the machine. The way I want to deal with individual men and women is with grace and with love and with compassion without compromise. I don't want to affirm them and celebrate sin, but neither do I want to alienate them. I want to follow the way of Jesus. And I believe that the power of God is in the gospel. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God into salvation for all who believe. And, and, and so uh, that's, that's the struggle there. So some of you today want me to attack the machine. And, and, and I'm okay with attacking the machine, but I'm not okay with attacking men and women who are sinners in need of a Savior. Okay? I want to lay that as the groundwork. Already you're breaking out the emails. All right, cool, whatever. <laughs> and here's the letter we wrote to our Sunday school teachers today, um, this week. God in his providence has provided a timely opportunity for his church to be reminded what the Bible clearly teaches regarding the biblical covenant of marriage and the current cultural pursuit to embrace homosexuality as an equally valid position. As your pastors who care deeply about you and for the truth of God to be proclaimed well, we want you to know that we're praying for God to prepare your heart throughout this week that you'll be able to teach with confidence on Sunday. Teaching on this issue may push you out of your comfort zone. So we wanted to offer our position on this issue for your guidance as and use as you teach. The Bible teaches that God created marriage and clearly defined what marriage is to be for all peoples, for all times, and for all places. Today, many are seeking to redefine marriage, but we believe that the scriptures are clear that God's design for marriage is one man and one woman together for life in a biblical covenant relationship. We're confident that the material you'll be teaching from that our church has provided for you and your class is biblical. Our prayer is that God will give you the grace to clearly and confidently relay that truth to your class. We also are praying that as truth is proclaimed, it is done so with grace. It has been said that truth dressed in anything other than grace is a wrecking ball. Jesus was full of both truth and grace, and the cross itself is a display of that perfect balance. 100% truth and 100% gracious. Grace Life has members who struggle every day with temptations that are of a homosexual nature. And although you may not know it, they may be an active part of your Sunday school class. These men and women are striving every day 
to honor Christ with their lives as they trust him to deliver them moment by moment from the power of this sin in their life. The way you teach this lesson and the way members of your class interact with this lesson should be in such a way that these fellow church members are not discouraged in the least, but rather are encouraged to continue to seek by divine aid to live carefully in the world, denying ungodly lust. As you prepare, if there are ways we can be of assistance, please don't hesitate giving any of us a call. We all need to be in prayer that as God's church, we will respond lovingly and compassionately to persons who have been drawn into this great deception. But to do so without compromising God's word. We believe Christ is honored when his people consistently show compassion without compromise. Interesting days are ahead for us in Alabama but we're trusting our sovereign God to lead and guide us as his church to be the light of Christ in this dark world. You're greatly loved and your service is very much appreciated, your pastors. So we're praying for our Sunday school classes as they deal with this today. And and, and I know part of the reason this is difficult is because it's very personal for us. Uh, Over half of our pastoral staff have family members who claim a a, a homosexual sexual orientation, a homosexual lifestyle. Many of you have family and friends who would also make that same claim. And so I wanted to avoid it today on the platform. I just wanted to let the Sunday school teachers kind of deal with that, but I didn't think that would be real fair. And, um, and I wrestled, man. I wrestled all week. I wrestled last night. I came down here about Three o'clock or four o'clock, Wesley. What time did I get here yesterday? About four o'clock yesterday afternoon. I stayed till after ten last night, just trying to figure out what what would God have me to do today. How do I deal with this? How do I how do I address this? And I, I really really struggled. I eventually decided that today I wanted you to hear from somebody else. I met a sweet couple earlier, and they said we've always come on weird Sundays. We've never heard you preach. And I said, well, you're not going going to today either. I want, I want you to hear from somebody else today, and today you're going to hear from a lady named Dr. Rosaria Butterfield, and I, I picked this particular video out um, for a couple of reasons. She shared this as a lecture at one of our Baptist seminaries, Southeastern Seminary. Um, she is brilliant. She speaks in a very high-minded way. You will struggle to keep up with her intellect today I'm just going to go ahead and tell you if you have if you brought a thinking cap you need to put it on right now I did that on purpose because there's part of this audience today that I this is one Sunday that I don't want a particular group in this audience to get what's being said we've got six-year-olds and up in this room and I'm mindful of that because I have a six-year-old and so I, I, I hope that you at your home are seeking God's wisdom and direction and guidance for how to speak to your children and, and shepherd your children in these days in which we live. But I think it would be very irresponsible of me to thrust that upon your family today if you're not ready for that. And so part of the reason for picking such a high-minded video is I, I'm, I want it to be over the heads of some people today, okay? And at moments, you're going to think, my gosh, it's over my head. It's okay. I, I felt the same way. But I want to encourage you to lock into it and pay attention to that. Um, secondly, I picked this video today, too, because I think with this discussion in our culture, in our community, we, we begin to stereotype a lot, right? We kind of begin to stereotype the uh, LGBT community. Maybe the LGBT community begins to stereotype, especially guys like me, white, southern, Baptist heterosexual pastor, right? And so I wanted you to hear from a woman today who uh, is from the North, um, who's highly educated, who's very sharp. I want you to hear her story. And I want you to hear it because I think she brings a perspective to this discussion today that everybody needs to hear, regardless of what you may think. Regardless of what people you may work with or people in your family may think, this is, I think Ms. Dr. Butterfield brings a perspective that everybody 
needs to hear. She knows firsthand that the power of the gospel can set any sinner free. And so as you listen to her today, I want to encourage you to listen for some of those themes that we've been talking about over the last several weeks, like gospel, like identity, like faith, like repentance. Because I think she says a lot in keeping with where we've been, okay? So having said that, I'm going to step back. Ladies and gentlemen, here's Dr. Rosaria Butterfield. Tonight, the Bush Center welcomes Dr. Rosaria Butterfield as our guest speaker. Dr. Butterfield earned her Ph.D. from Ohio State University in English Literature in 1992 and served in the English Department and Women's Studies program at Syracuse University from 1992 to 2002, publishing a book and scholarly articles on feminist theory, queer theory, 19th century British literature. She received tenure in 1999, providentially the same year that Christ claimed her for his own. She is the author of The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, An English Professor's Journey into Christian Faith. As I said, that book is available in the vestibule, and she will be available after our event for, uh, to sign the book. Rosaria lives in Durham, North Carolina, uh, with her husband, Kent, who is pastor of the First Reformed Presbyterian Church of Durham. Tonight, Dr. Butterfield will be lecturing on sexuality, Identity and the Doctrine of Repentance, My Train Wreck Conversion. Dr. Butterfield's lecture will address questions such as, Is sexual orientation a real category? Are people born gay? And do our feelings determine our identities? Our testimonies of God's grace reveal the inner landscape of the power of the Holy Spirit to change hearts and lives. Tonight's lectures, a lecture will talk about sin, grace, and change in both personal and doctrinal terms. Dr. Butterfield will discuss her former homosexuality, feminism, university culture, and gospel integrity that's shown through the lives of her Christian neighbors and friends. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Rosaria Butterfield. Thank you. Praying for you. Thank you. You haven't heard me yet, though. Thank you. How do I tell you about my conversion to Christianity without making it sound like an alien abduction or a train wreck? Truth be told, it felt a little like both. The language normally used to describe this odd miracle does not work for me. I didn't read one of those tacky self-help books with a thin coating of Christian themes, examine my life against the tenets of the Bible the way one might hold up one car insurance policy against all others and cleanly and logically make a decision for Christ. While I did make choices along the path of this journey, they never felt logical, risk-free, or sane. Neither did I feel like the victim of an emotional earthquake and collapse gracefully into the arms of my Savior like a holy and sanctified Scarlet O'Hara, having been claimed by Christ's irresistible grace. Heretical as it may seem, Christ and Christianity seemed eminently resistible. My Christian life unfolded as I was just living my life, my normal life, in the normal course of life, questions emerged that exceeded my secular feminist worldview. These questions sat quietly in the crevices of my mind until I met a most unlikely friend, a Christian pastor. Had a pastor named Ken Smith not shared the gospel with me for years and years, over and over again, not in some used car salesman way, but in an organic, spontaneous, and compassionate way, those questions might still be lodged in the crevices of my mind, and I might never have met the most unlikely of friends, Jesus Christ himself. I was raised in the Catholic faith, and I attended predominantly liberal Catholic schools. My liberal Catholic all-girl high school discipled me in the life skills that I use today. I learned there to read deeply and well, to diagram a sentence before I tried to interpret it, 
and to look out for the unloved and draw them in. I had a heterosexual adolescence, or so I presumed. In college, I met my first boyfriend. It was a heady experience. At the same time, an undercurrent of longing inserted itself in my intense friendships with women. I didn't make much of this at first. From the age of 22 until 28, I continued to date men and at the same time feel a sense of longing and connection that simply toppled over the edges for my women friends. This repetitious sensibility rooted and grew. I simply preferred the company of women. In my late 20s, enhanced by feminist philosophy and LGBT political advocacy, my homosocial preference morphed into homosexuality. That shift was subtle, not blatant. My lesbian identity and my love for my LGBT community developed in sync with my lesbian sexual practice. Life finally came together for me and made sense. I studied Freud. I cheered that the DSM had long since removed homosexuality from its list of disorders, thus rendering homosexuality in the eyes of the world and the academy normal. With no prohibitions or constraints, by the time I graduated from Ohio State with my PhD in English literature and critical theory, I left the Buckeye State with my first lesbian partner. We moved to New York for me to begin a tenure-track position in the English department at Syracuse University. My life as a lesbian seemed normal. I considered it an enlightened, chosen path. Lesbianism felt like a cleaner and more moral choice. Always preferring symmetry to asymmetry, I believed I had found my real self. What happened to my Catholic training? I believed now that it was hogwash, hocus pocus, hooey. The name Jesus, which had rolled off my tongue in a little girl's prayers, then rolled off my back in college, now made me recoil in anger. As a professor of English and women's studies, I cared about morality, justice, and compassion. As a 19th century scholar, fervent for the worldviews of Freud, Hegel, Marx, and Darwin, I strove to stand with the disempowered. I valued morality. And my life at this time was happy and meaningful and full. My next lesbian partner and I shared many vital interests, AIDS activism, children's health and literacy, Golden Retriever Rescue, our Unitarian Universalist Church, just to name a few. It was hard to argue that she and I were anything but good citizens and caregivers. The LGBT community values hospitality and applies it with skill, sacrifice, and integrity. Indeed, I honed the hospitality gifts that I use today as a pastor's wife in my former queer community. I began researching the religious right and their politics of hatred against people like me. And to do this, I began reading the Bible while looking for some Bible scholar to help me wade through this complex book. I took note that the Bible was an engaging literary display of every genre and trope and type. It had edgy poetry, deep and complex philosophy, and compelling narrative stories. It also embodied a worldview that I hated. Sin, repentance, Sodom and Gomorrah, absurd. At this time, the Promise Keepers came to town and parked their little circus at the university. <laughs> On my war against stupid, I wrote an article published in the local newspaper. It was 1997. The article generated many rejoinders, so many that I kept a Xerox box on each side of my desk, one for hate mail and one for fan mail. One letter that I received, though, defied my filing system. It was from Ken Smith, the pastor of the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church. It was a kind and inquiring letter. Ken didn't argue with my article. Rather, he asked me to defend the presuppositions that undergirded it. In his letter, he shared his love for the Bible, his concern that college students were not reading the Bible as part of a literature curriculum, and he described Jesus as someone who had entered into history not someone who emerged from it. 
I thought that was insane. I believed that people proceeded from history and are shaped for good or for ill by the culture that molds them. I didn't know how to respond to the letter, so I threw it away. And later that night, I fished it out of the department's recycling bin and put it back on my desk where it stared at me for a week, confronting me with the worldview divide that demanded a response. As a postmodern intellectual, I operated from a historical materialist worldview, but Christianity is a supernatural worldview. If I was going to understand how this book, the Bible, got so many people off track and how this man, Jesus, persuaded so many people to follow him, Ken's letter showed me that I needed to understand Christianity as a supernatural idea. At this point in my life, the category of the supernatural was reserved for Stephen King novels. With the letter, Ken initiated two years of bringing the church to me, a heathen. Oh, I had seen my share of Bible verses on placards at gay pride marches, that Christians who mocked me at gay pride day were happy that I and everyone I loved was going to hell was as clear as the sky is blue. But Ken's letter didn't mock. It engaged. So when he invited me to dinner at his house to discuss these matters more fully, I accepted. My motives at the time were clear. Surely this would be good for my research. But something else happened. Ken and his wife, Floy, and I became friends. They entered my world. They met my friends. We did book exchanges. We talked openly about sexuality and politics. They did not act as if such conversations were polluting them. They did not treat me like a blank slate. When we ate together, Ken prayed in a way that I had never heard before. His prayers were intimate, vulnerable. He repented of his sin in front of me. He thanked God for all things. Ken's God was holy and firm, yet full of mercy. Ken and Floyd omitted two important steps in the rule book of how Christians should deal with a heathen like me on that first night that I had dinner with them. They did not share the gospel with me, and they did not invite me to church. Because of these omissions to the Christian rule book, as I had come to know it, that night when Ken extended his hand in friendship to me, I knew it was safe for me to close my hand in his. I started meeting with Ken and Floy regularly, reading the Bible in earnest with pen in hand and notebook in lap. I read the way a glutton devours. Slowly and over time, the Bible started to take on a life and a meaning that startled me. Some of my well-worn paradigms no longer stuck. I had to at least ponder the hermeneutical claim that this book was different from all the others because it was inspired by a holy God and inherently true and trustworthy. And this led me to go through the presuppositional truth claims to, just to check the math of the meaning here. And the logic claims went like this for me. Number one, if this was a book written by men who were inspired by the Holy Spirit, then its admonitions about sin were not what I had been calling them applied cultural phobia. Why? Well because God's goodness, unrestrained by time, anticipates and guards against the ill treatment of people. And two, if God is the creator of all things, and if the Bible has his seal of truth and power, then the Bible had a right to interrogate my life and my culture, not the other way around. Even as a postmodern reader, I understood that the idea of authority can only depend on that which is higher than itself. Well, who is higher than God, I wondered. At a dinner gathering that my partner and I were hosting, my transgendered friend Jay cornered me in the kitchen. She put her large hand over mine and said, Rosaria, this Bible reading is changing you. I felt exposed. I felt like I was going to throw up. I collapsed in the chair and I exhaled. Jackie, what if it's true? What if Jesus is a real and risen Lord? What if we are all in trouble? 
Jay exhaled deeply and sat down in the chair across from mine. Her eyes looked wise, and she said, Rosaria, I was a Presbyterian minister for 15 years. I prayed that God would heal me, but he didn't. If you want, I will pray for you. The next day, when I returned home from work, I found two large milk crates spilling over with theological books, Jay's books. She was giving them to me. In Calvin's Institutes, in the margins of the exposition of the Book of Romans, in Jay's handwriting was a warning, quote, watch Romans 1. This is where I will fall. And this is what Romans 1, 21 through 27 says. For even, they, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their heart to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. And for this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. Look at the verb clauses here did not honor God, did not give thanks, engaged in futile speculations, became fools, exchanged the incorruptible for the corruptible. God gives us over to our lusts, and when we look at the world through our lusts, we dishonor our bodies and we worship the world. This verse seemed to provide a haunting literary echo to Genesis 3, where Eve's desire to live independently of God's authority made perfect sense to me. If I were Eve, I would have done the same thing. And at the same time, Eve and then Adam's seemingly innocent sin served as the leverage for the whole world to come tumbling down, fierce and fast, bloody and brilliant. The two verses, one in Genesis and one in Romans, stood out as bookends of my life. Not just my life, that's the rub. Genesis 3 and Romans 1 stood out as the table of contents of what ails the world. Indeed, Romans 1 does not end by highlighting homosexuality as the worst and most extreme example of the sin of failing to give God glory for creating us. Here is where the passage finds its crescendo. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, and although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Homosexuality then, at least according to the Bible, is not the end point of the problem for God or for the world, but it is presented here as one step in the journey. Homosexuality then is consequential, not causal. According to the Bible itself, homosexuality was not the root of all sin, not even the root of my sin. This stopped me in my tracks. Somehow, it was easier to hate the Bible when it squared off against me. But now that it was getting under my skin, it became a foe of a different kind. So I tried to toss the Bible and its teachings in the trash. I really tried. But Ken had become my friend, and he encouraged me to keep reading. And because I trusted him, I did. As I read and reread the Bible, I kept catching my wings in its daily embrace. I was fighting the idea that the Bible is inspired and inerrant, that is, that its meaning and purpose has a holy and supernatural authority that has protected it over the years of its canonicity. 
and that it is the repository of truth. How could a smart cookie like me believe or embrace these things? I didn't even believe in truth. I was a postmodernist. I believed in truth claims. I believed that the reader constructed the text, that a text's meaning found its power only in the reader's interpretation of it. Without a reader, a book is just paper and glue, I told my students over and over again. How could this one book lay claim to a birthright and progeny so different from all the others? That this book was supernatural was becoming more and more evident to me, and my hermeneutical bag of tricks had no system of containment for it. As I was reading and discussing these things with Ken, he pointed out to me that Jesus is the word made flesh, and that knowing Jesus demands embracing the Jesus of the Bible, the whole Bible, not just the Jesus of someone's imagination, even the places that took my life captive. And after years and years of this, something happened. The Bible got to be bigger inside me than I. It overflowed into my world. I fought against it with all my might. And then one Sunday morning, two years after I first met Ken and Floy, and two years after I started reading the Bible for my research, I left the bed I shared with my lesbian partner, and an hour later, I sat in a pew at the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church. I say this not to be lurid, but merely to remind us that we simply do not know the treacherous journey that other people take to get to church. Conspicuous of my appearance, I reminded myself that I came there to meet God, not to fit in. Ken was preaching through the Gospel of Matthew with its bewildering cast of characters and problems, unsuspecting folks separated unto the Gospel, seeds choked by the world, feeding thousands with some poor nameless kids bread and fish, and then Jesus' cutting question to impetuous Peter, do you still lack understanding? followed by Pastor Ken's steely blue eyes and a long pause before he turned this question to us. Congregation, did Christ ever say this to you? He said. That startled me. I thought sermons were just lectures. I didn't know he was going to start talking to us like that. But that was my question. That question was for me. Do I still lack understanding? And I had to wonder who was speaking there the man behind the pulpit or the God-man behind the foundation and redemption of his people. And the image that crashed like waves in a raging sea of me and everyone I love suffering in hell vomited into my consciousness and gripped me in its teeth, not primarily because we were gay, but because we were proud. We wanted to be autonomous. It was our hearts first. Our bodies followed. I got it. I heard it finally. I counted the costs, and I did not like the math. This was my crucible, and it is my crucible. If the Bible is true, I was dead. If the Bible is false, I am the biggest fool on earth. But God's promises rolled in like another round of waves into my world. And one Lord's Day, Ken was preaching on John 7:17. 7, if anyone wills to do God's will, he shall know concerning the doctrine. This verse exposed the quicksand in which my feet were stuck. I was a thinker. I was paid to read books and write about them. I expected that in all areas of my life, understanding came before obedience, not the other way around. I wanted God to show me on my terms why homosexuality was a sin. I wanted to be the judge, not the one being judged. Perhaps I thought, like Eve in the garden, I wanted to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so that I could become and replace God. I wondered, hadn't I already done this? Hadn't we all? If my consciousness fell in Adam's sin, as the Bible purports, no wonder I couldn't think my way out of this quandary. This wasn't a game of thinking and a matching of wits. 
Could my heart, though, echo God's call for obedience? Could I, quote, will to do God's will, unquote, just this once? The stakes were so very high. They always are. But the verse promised understanding after obedience. I wrestled with the question, did I really want to understand homosexuality from God's point of view, or did I just want to argue with him? I prayed that night that God would give me the willingness to obey before I understood. I prayed that God would make me a godly woman. I prayed that God would give me the faith to repent of my sin at its root. What is the root of my sin? I did not then and I do not now think that the root of homosexuality is homosexuality. How does one repent of a sin that doesn't feel like a sin at all, but feels like normal, not bothering another soul kind of life? How would I come to this place? What is the root of the sin of sexual identity? I was a jumble of emotions, but I prayed that the Lord would help me to see my life from his point of view. And the next morning, when I woke up and I looked in the mirror, I looked the same. But when I looked in the mirror of the Bible, I wondered, am I a lesbian or has this all been a case of mistaken identity? If Jesus could split the world asunder, divide the soul and the spirit, judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart, could he make my true identity prevail? Who am I? Who will God have me to be? I still felt like a lesbian in body and heart. That, that is, I felt my real identity. But what is my true identity? The Bible makes clear that the real and the true have a troubled relationship on this side of eternity. For many people in the Bible, their true identity and calling comes only after a long struggle with God, with wilderness, and with dreams, and hopes, and plans. The Bible makes clear that my future and my calling always echo an attribute of God. Obedience constrains. It always mirrors suffering, as every selection implies a sacrifice. What is bigger, my lesbian identity and the feminist and postmodern worldview that fuels it, or God's authority over me and holy sovereignty over the world? Who is this Jesus? Did I know him? Did I still lack understanding? Could I trust him? And then, one ordinary day, I came to Jesus. No altar calls in a Reformed Presbyterian church, so no fanfare or manipulation. We were singing from Psalm 119, line 56. This has become mine because forever all thy precepts I preserve. After I sang these words, something shifted. Two weight-bearing walls collapsed in my mind. The first wall came crashing down because I had just sung condemnation unto myself, and I knew it. This Bible was not mine. I had scorned it and cursed it and despised it. But I had been reading and rereading this book, and the use of the helping verb here, has, and has become, troubled me. Two years of laborious reading embodies the helping verb, has. It showed process, journey, pilgrimage, and danger but I was not quote unquote in Christ and therefore could not possibly keep those precepts in word, heart change, or deed. And here was the shattering of the second wall. I had read the Bible many times through and I saw for myself that it had a holy author. I saw for myself that it was a canonized collection of 66 books with a unified biblical revelation. I heard for myself that when the words, this has become mine, came out of my mouth in congregational singing, I was attesting to this one simple truth, that the line of communication that God ordained for his people required this wrestling with scripture, and that I truly wanted to both hear God's voice breathed into my life 
and I wanted God to hear my prayers. The fog burned away. The whole Bible, each jot and tittle, was my open highway to a holy God. My hands let go of the wheel of self-invention. I came to Jesus alone, open-handed and naked. I had no dignity upon which to stand. It was a crushing revelation. It was Jesus I had been persecuting the whole time. And in this war of worldviews, Ken and Floyd were there. The church who had been praying for me for years in the background, quietly, they were there. Jesus triumphed, and I was a broken mess. I lost everything but the dog. And he was a good dog. But he's dead now, so that's another story. <laughs> so now he's a good dead dog. <laughs> but I'm gonna go on. <laughs> of course, there's only one thing to do when you meet the living God. You must fall on your face and repent of your sins. And repentance is bittersweet business. Repentance is not just some conversion exercise. It is the posture of the Christian much like tree or full lotus is the posture of the yogi. Repentance is our daily fruit, our hourly washing, our minute-by-minute -minute wake up call, our reminder of God's creation, Jesus' blood, and the Holy Spirit's comfort. Repentance is the only no-shame solution to a renewed Christian conscience because all it does is prove the obvious, that God was right all along. I speak today about matters that happened over a decade ago. God has taken me on a long journey, and like most pilgrimages, mine tends to engender more questions than answers. So in the time we have left, I want to take up one question about sexuality and the Christian faith that I am repeatedly asked. Why did I have to give up my girlfriend for Christ? Why couldn't I have both? After all, can't someone believe in Jesus and be gay? So, let's unpack this. Number one, can someone struggle with homoerotic attraction and be a faithful believer in Christ's atoning work? Yes, yes, people can struggle with every sin of every branch and stripe, but can someone unrepentingly embrace and deny as sin homoerotic lust, allowing it to flourish and root as a practice and an identity, and then add Jesus to this identity and call it the Christian faith? No. Why no? Why isn't this no an example of homophobia and its rejection of the idea that the individual sets the terms of her own sexual identity? What about people whose gender identity is clearly liminal, or people who perceive themselves to be born with a deep and abiding and unrelenting sense of gay identity and selfhood? Because the Bible is sufficient for how we understand sexuality and how we mortify sin, we do not need to add anything to it when seeking help. It is simple and difficult all at the same time. We indeed are all, quote unquote, born this way, although what this references may be different. We are all in the same boat. Salvation begins with God's sovereign initiation, not with my intellectual assent to a moral framework about normative sexuality or a set of ideas, or a desire to get rich, or have a happy life. It is a dangerous lie to say that Christians are people who merely believe in Jesus. Even the demons believed in Jesus, and it sent them straight to hell. Of course, lies are called half-truths for a reason. Dangerous ideas often contain large dollops of truth. The idea that a Christian is merely someone who believes in Jesus, though, is the whopper deception of this present age. After God's sovereign invitation, after the Holy Spirit removes the heart of stone and replaces it with a heart of flesh, 
we fall on our faces as we hear the still, small voice of God. We relinquish our lives to him as his sovereign grace commands this. We relinquish all of it, and we keep nothing back. This includes our sexuality. We were born this way, we were all born this way, and this is what it means to have Adam as our representative head, to have fallen with Adam in his first sin, and to be born with original sin. So how do we hear God? Is it an audible voice? No. God speaks to us through the language of the Bible. The Bible is key. We train our ears to hear the Lord by drinking deeply of his holy word, his word, his direct word, not the themes of Christianity that we create in personal artwork or dance. Nothing that we create will have the power to save, discern, or sanctify. Not one creation of ours will even come close to the sharp edges and the sanctifying blood of our Savior. We commit our lives to the Jesus of the Bible, the Word made flesh, who came to fulfill the whole law, every jot and tittle, and we do not use our own personal experience to verify the validity of God's commands. The Christian faith is simply not a pragmatist's paradigm. We die to the old man or woman, and we become alive in Christ, or we do not know him. He is the potter, we are the clay. In sanctification, we synergistically work with God to grow in a likeness of Jesus by drinking deeply of the means of grace, Bible reading, psalm singing, worship, taking the sacraments, church membership, fellowship with other believers, the perseverance of the saints. In so doing, we take our rightful place as sons and daughters of the covenant. We do not look to ourselves to see if we measure up because we do not. We look to Christ. When Jesus died and rose again, he gave sin a mortal blow. Thomas Brooks compares our sin to a tree that has been cut at the root. The tree may pop a few leaves, but its inevitable fate is death. And so too we see our sin. It no longer comes at us with full potency. It is a snake or a lion with its jaw wired shut. Sin may sucker punch us, but never slay us because Christ's death gave sin its inevitable death. If you are in Christ, you are daily growing in sanctification. That is how Christ heals us from the consequence of our sin, whatever that sin may be, by giving us daily victory over it, by never divorcing us even when we fall and are weak, and by giving himself to us as an example. Christ did not die all at once upon the cross, so also the slaying of sin is gradual in the souls of saints, says Thomas Brooks. Sexual sin has many tendrils, but by Christ's stripes we are healed. He pours the supernatural balm of Christian victory into the grooves of our sin patterns, our body memories, until the holes are filled with his grace and until attacks and seductions no longer stop us in our tracks. And that is what it means to be a new creature in Christ. God separates us unto the gospel to reveal his son in us. Recognizing that God gave us our will, we put our will on his altar. We use God's vocabulary and God's dictionary. We call sin, sin, no matter what our personal feelings or experiences are simply how good it feels. We call grace, grace, and we drink deeply from its well. We are God's image bearers, and we encourage other image bearers to spend more time looking at the original than at the reflection. We do not domesticate sin by calling it something else. So this question, it is a persistent question for our times. Can a person retain an unrepentingly gay personal identity and claim Christ's headship, lordship, and salvation? Indeed, that is what the, the Raleigh-based advocacy group, the Gay Christian Network, wants you to believe. 
Other well-known Christians are calling themselves gay Christians as well. Who are we to argue with the use of a descriptive adjective like gay to modify the noun Christian? Does it matter? And this is a rhetorical question because as an English professor, I always think these kinds of things matter. Does it matter that the linguistic purpose of a descriptive adjective is to actually indicate the quality of the noun that it modifies? These are not small matters. What is in a word, you might ask? Everything. Jesus is the word made flesh. All power is in the word. Christ will have all of us, not part of us. We may struggle with all manner of sin and temptation in this world. Nowhere in the Bible is there a recorded prayer where anyone gets to order up his own personal program for sanctification. As Oswald Chambers puts it, sanctification is not my idea of what I want God to do for me. Sanctification is God's idea of what he wants to do for me. So, what is the Christian response to our family and our friends in the LGBT community? Let's turn to Ephesians 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he, the Father, chose us in him, the Son, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him, in love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. Recently, someone said this to me, Rosaria, give up this ministry. It is dangerous and unnecessary, and those people are going straight to hell anyway. But I believe that God's elect people are in the gay and lesbian community too, and that changes everything. Ezekiel 37.3 puts it in terms of a question. Son of man, can these bones live? What about my bones or, or your bones? Were they somehow less dead? Do we remember the humbling moment when we first knocked at God's door, standing there, the crucified thief? To this, you might say, Rosaria, if God's elect people are in the gay and lesbian community, why aren't they rushing into our churches saying, how can we be saved? Why instead do we see whole branches of the Christian faith rejecting orthodoxy for revisionism, domesticating the sin of homosexuality, and declaring a false peace? Dear Christian, is it possible that we are perhaps in no small part to blame? Homosexuality is a sin, but so too is homophobia. And what is homophobia? It's the unrestrained fear of gay and lesbian people and the wholesale writing off of their souls. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Familiar passage, no temptation has overcome you, but such that is common to man, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Now think about this. What if the way of escape for our brothers and sisters in the LGBT community is your house or mine, your church or mine? Are we too busy? Are we too scared? Are we part of the problem or the solution? Are we good company for the suffering? Do we seek, secretly harbor the heresy that people's world-defined identities overpower God's imprint of his soul upon us? Are we willing to speak the truth in love across the long haul of unconditional friendship? Do we not want to rock the boat with gospel truth or do we only want to rock the boat, reducing people who do not yet know Christ to stereotypes, to mock and despise? Are we afraid of breaking our hearts on the rock of Christ as we shake the gates of heaven in prayer? God's journey for me has been rigorous. 
and my former life while under the blood can still lurk at times in the edges of my heart. God changed my heart's desires, but memories while dulling have not disappeared. I pray for the names from my past that intrude into my present at unpredictable times. God saved me, but he did not lobotomize me. But bigger than this, I have not forgotten the blood that Jesus surrendered for this life, this very one, where today I live in the shelter of a covenant family, where one calls me wife and many call me mother, this precious, never imagined jewel of a life in Christ Jesus, my Lord and my Savior, a life whose edges only pale because in Christ so much more awaits me and so much more is promised. Thank you. So I know that might have been kind of hard to listen to because that's a way of speaking that you don't hear often and it's a voice that probably you've never heard, but it's a voice that you needed to hear today and it's a story that you needed to hear and what you did hear that should be very familiar to you is the gospel and the power of the gospel and what Jesus will do uh, in anybody's life by grace through faith. And this morning I know that in this room there are people who are struggling with sin. And you may be struggling in particularly with sexual sin this morning of a homosexual nature or of a heterosexual nature or of a pornographic nature. I don't know what the type of sin is that you may be struggling with, but there is power through the shed blood of Jesus that is available today to deliver you from that sin. The reality is some of us today are struggling with self-righteousness because our skin color is different. We think God looks more favorably upon us or because the sin that we struggle with is different than the sin that somebody else struggles with we think that God looks more favorably upon us that's not the gospel that's arrogance and that's pride and the gospel is not the phrase that we say so often love the sinner but hate the sin the gospel is love the sinner and hate your own sin because we got to camp out as God's people at the bottom of that tree in repentance and confession. And that's where we have to live our lives before a holy God. And in that place, that's a posture of humility, not pride and not arrogance. And some of you today, your hearts are broken because people that you love and you care about are caught up in this deception of the age in which we live. And you're praying for them that they would be changed. Not that, not that they would turn from homosexuality to heterosexuality. That's, heterosexuality is not the answer for homosexuality. Jesus is the answer. The gospel is the answer. We don't exist as God's people to try to make everybody exist and live their lives in the confines of heterosexual relationship. If you had to find purpose and value and meaning in a heterosexual relationship, then Jesus never had purpose or value or meaning. Purpose and value and meaning is always found in who God is. Our identity is always rooted in Him and what He's done for us. And I know we are pressed for time, but I want to invite you to stand, and I want us to pray this morning. And this just kind of begins our gospel-centered conversation about this issue. I, I had no expectation that this would fix everything today. It won't. But I hope it does maybe begin to lay some good, Christ-honoring, gospel-centered groundwork for how we can walk through this together. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, thank you for our time together today. It's been another weird Sunday at Grace Life, but a Sunday that we needed to be here for and to hear and to be a part of. God, I pray that we wouldn't just rush through this issue that's before us in such an epic way that we wouldn't just throw out quick and familiar lines that cut off gospel-centered communication and conversation. God, that we would today bring our sin and our struggle before you, believing that the shed blood of Jesus is more than enough to set us free from its grip on our lives. That we would bring our self-righteousness that causes us to look down 
on other people before you and that we would see your son hanging on that cross and recognize that we have nothing to boast in except Jesus. And that you would break our hearts today, God, for what breaks yours. I know your heart's broken today for people who are lost without Jesus. People who are sinking in the destruction and death grip of sin. God, would you move in our hearts and live through us in such a way that we would be able to love people and pray for people the way you would have us to. We need your wisdom and your grace, and we thank you that you are those things in us now because of Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Let's sing together. Let's pray together. This is the prayer that we sing to the Lord. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me
want to thank you that I sense among your people today a deep gospel driven humility and a brokenness in our heart God for those who need Christ and God I thank you that I sense that in this place today that we would not be angry and ugly and mean in the way that we deal with other people and that we would not be weak and passive in the way that we deal with your word and your holiness but that your son Jesus would live victoriously through us and that the perfection of grace and truth would be made known as you live in and through your people. We love you and we thank you that as we walk in days that we have never walked in before, we thank you that when everything around us seems to be changing, that this is true still today. The tomb is still empty and the throne is still occupied and you are still Lord of all. So we fix our eyes on you and we love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I know it's late and you're going to bump into about 300 people when you walk out that door. But I hope you'll go to Sunday school. I hope you'll keep gospel-centered conversations moving forward for God's glory.